Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the podcast. This week, I wanted to invite John Fly on. Um, now, John is a, uh, I would say, probably the best steady cam operator that I know of. Um, he's worked on such things as Red Dwarf, uh, BBC, ITV, those kind of uh, big big uh, productions um, from what you um, you know would expect if you're watching this channel or, or would normally have seen from these channels. Um, so yeah, so this was a really, really interesting interview. We talked about many, many things. Um, you know, the just some some highlights are, you know, why you should shoot on a steady cam over a gimbal, the changes which that makes, um, some, you know, his, his and my thoughts on uh, 1917, a little bit ago that came out, some very, very good film, and uh, then also some other gems in there as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming back and watching uh, the, or listening to this podcast. And if you would like to not miss next week's episode, it will be out on Monday at 6pm as always. So make sure to leave this video with a like and also be subscribed to the channel. And I will see you very, very soon. Hi there, my name's John Fry and I run Fry Film Productions uh, just outside of Salisbury. We've been operating for oh, nearly 20 years, I suppose. Uh, I started off as a a cameraman, a freelance cameraman, and uh, as with many things these days, it was sort of forced by my accountant to turn into a limited company, uh, which during uh, the current climate has uh, proved uh, um, unhelpful, but still. I've been involved in, uh, started off mainly in outside broadcasting, so multi-camera shows and stuff like that for TV and corporate clients and big uh, awards shows and things like that fell into um, more of the corporate world, uh, which is why my IMDb page isn't very exciting, but uh, uh, I do live in a nice house. So that's, the, that's the sort of trade-off. <laughs> um, uh, what else can I say? I've, uh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm my greatest uh, accolade is being a, a Steadicam operator and instructor. So I teach people how to use the Steadicam uh, after many years using it myself, um, and that's the body-worn stabilizer for, for big cameras, uh, which has led me into all facets of film and television uh, and, uh, you know, video production world. Uh, I've done everything from big Bollywood films to short films locally to TV shows like uh, Springwatch and Red Dwarf and Car SOS and you know odd bits and pieces all over the place. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm jack of all trades a little bit, but uh, with an emphasis on moving camera, lighting pictures nicely, and multi camera, I guess. No, it sounds uh you know it sounds interesting. I think there's a lot of uh, crossover, and for me, it's very interesting because um, you know I stumbled upon. Uh, you uh, a while ago you know looking at what other people were doing in Salisbury and what the videographers and, and you know film creators were doing in Salisbury specifically and um, for me it was interesting seeing kind of more I'll use the term higher end um, than than what I do um, in the respect to um, for obvious reasons you're you know a lot further on in your career and, and, and you've also been doing it a lot longer so, so that makes a lot of sense and goes with the kind of um, higher end aspects as well but I think for me, it's also been something to sort of, in some ways, see where I could be in 10 years, 20 years, five years, you know, or however long, um, you know, in that respect. So for me, it's it's been very interesting. Um, how did you, I know you briefly, briefly sort of um, talked about how you got started in your business and, and you know, you, you doing camera work and, and that kind of thing. Could you just sort of talk a little bit more about how you actually got specifically started because i think that a lot of people um especially people who i know who do listen to this podcast are asking me quite a lot you know using this time and they want to get started in making videos and they want to get started in video production but they don't necessarily know the right way or the not necessarily the right way but you know the way um that others have done it well uh, i think whoever you ask their story is going to be different because the pathway that that i wanted to take and that a lot of uh, older cameramen took to get into film television and no longer exists so you used to be able to go to the bbc as a trainee and you'd work your way up into the camera department and eventually uh, you might get put on a camera at television center and there you would stay for the rest of your career probably um, unless you moved into drama or something like that a bit higher end later on um, by the time i'd finished university i did film and television um, so i had all the the groundwork done with with uh, a good grounding of a history of film and TV, um, 
best practices, all that sort of stuff you learn at university, even if, uh, you know, some of it can be a bit uninspiring. Um, uh, so uh, after I finished university, that, that pathway didn't exist. You know, the BBC had closed down um, sort of television centre for its own production and weren't, you know, there just wasn't that opportunity. So um, the way I got in was uh, essentially, well, it's, 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 it's very odd. I rang people up. Uh, and said, do you want a hand? So there was a, a local sound guy. Uh, I'm not sure. I think he may have retired now. Uh, went along to help him on, on a few ITV shows, um, which was really useful. I was just assisting him so I could see how a prof professional environment worked. I got to see uh, the sort of level of detail and, um, uh, yeah, ju just how it worked, just how people operate, how they communicate in, in a, in a, in a top-end production environment. Um, and that was quite quite handy, um, as well as what equipment people were using, the sort of base, lower, middle grades of equipment that people use then. It's all different now, of course, because it's all uh, sort of changing all the time uh, now as things got more fluid. When I started, for example, the standard camcorder that you would buy as a to be a cameraman, you know, this is what was expected. The standard that was expected um, would have been something like a Digibeta sony camcorder and the base model with no viewfinder no microphone no lens no battery just the camcorder would have cost you fifty thousand pounds so as you can imagine it was a, a a rather smaller pool of people applying for those jobs um and if you'd got to the point where you could afford to buy something like that even on lease or finance which we used to do um you know you had to be pretty confident that you were going to get the work to pay for it um, and that's a big difference between now, of course, where you can shoot something on your iPhone that will go on BBC One, uh, <laughs> which has been happening quite a lot over the last few months. Um, so essentially, yeah, I, I, I called people, uh, local, local professional people. Um, I tried very hard to get in BBC, Meridian, all that sort of stuff. And that never really worked until I was already at a level. So I've worked for both of them as a Steadicam operator, but they were never interested as a cameraman when I was starting out, um, as, as you can imagine. However, I did work with BBC and ITV camera people and sound people um, working for them directly. So that's my biggest bit of advice now is, is make, make those contacts. Um, yeah, there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing old boy network about it. You just have to ring people up and present yourself as a, you know, somebody who's worth having along. Um, and that's, that's really how I got started. Um, with the, with the big stuff, um, I was lucky enough to meet a couple of guys who were into outside broadcasting, who taught the multicam element of our course when I did the, the Bournemouth film and TV course. Um, and I, I got on really well with them and I was fascinated by the whole idea of outside broadcasting. So whenever they had some proper jobs to go on, I was always the first to volunteer to be, uh, you know, dog's body or whatever, or uh, whatever on those on their big jobs. And and consequently, I, after a while, I got a chance to go on camera and somebody noticed I was quite good at it. And I got recommended for another job. And, you know, that's how that's how that sort of happened. But on one of these jobs, which I think was in, you know, the big Park Lane Hilton, which um, belongs to someone else now, um, it was a big big job um and a guy called brian had uh, a steady cam and i thought oh my god this has a steady cam that's the coolest thing ever and he said oh you know what this is and i said yeah because since i was about 14 or 15 i've i've wanted to wanted to see one um and i'd actually been saving up to to take the big steady cam course in london um uh, for ages uh, and you know it was two or three thousand quid and brian said brian let me have a go and he said oh you know what you're what you're doing with this and I'd I'd got one of the little handheld ones so I'd got I'd got some practice um hurt obviously this is what the big ones do you put them on for the first five minutes and it's all it's using muscle groups and things that you've never perhaps ex exercised that way before so it's painful initially but he saw I, I sort of knew what I was doing so he said well you don't want to do that course in London the guy who used to run it lives in Wimborne uh, so, so he gave me uh, the number of a great guy called Dave Crute, who uh, has, you know, millions and millions of, of TV credits to his name. Uh, I met up with him and he offered to train me up on the understanding that when I was good enough, I would hire his equipment to do jobs with. Um, and fast forward five years and he and I were running the 
uh, instructing the National Film and TV School Steadicam course together. So that was another way of, of uh, you know, the, as soon as I started doing Steadicam, the, the world opened up because it's a much more mm-hmm. specialised thing. And also something which I think that can't be necessarily emulated by anything else. So, you know, if you have that skill set, I think that you can't really emulate it. And, and I, I, you know, I don't really mean any disrespect with this, but, you know, for me, I use a person, I use a Glycam and I've, I've learned Glycam and, and, you know, I love Glycam, but it cannot, people say, oh, why don't you use a gimbal? It's easier. Why don't you use, you know, motorized gimbal and this and that? I'm like, it looks different. I don't know Absolutely. whether it's just me. Takes the, it but takes all the it looks different. movement out of it, I find. Um, and I, I do yeah. use gimbals as well, um, but they do do the job slightly differently. Um, there is an electronicness to the gimbals that, that is less natural. And the whole idea of Steadicam in the first place was, um, in the words of Garrett Brown, the inventor, who I've met once or twice, lovely fellow, very tall. Um, he, the idea was to move through an environment and see... Uh, through camera movement, the world the way that a human being does. Um, and as soon as you introduce electronic elements into that, you lose some of that natural movement. And it, it, it does have a disconnecting... Um, uh, it does disconnect the, 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 the viewer slightly from, from what's going on if they can see it's a, an electronic stabilizer. You know, um, there's a, something about it that just just switches people off. Whereas Steadicam doesn't happen that way. Um, they just flow through an environment the way you walk through with the stabilization that your brain gives your eyes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, but I think it is definitely, you know, a lot of people ask me, oh, should I? Because, you know, there's a point where people, when they start out, they, you know, and I'm sure you've had these questions as well, where they get to a point where they want to start stabilizing their footage more than just using techniques handheld wise. Oh yeah. And they're like, right, I want to, I, I want to buy something. Right. But then the question comes, what do I buy? Right. And most people ask me, you know, oh, should I buy a Glycam or should I buy a gimbal? If I should buy a gimbal, what, what gimbal should I buy? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, for me, I think that it's, it's one of those things where, you should think about firstly what look you're looking to achieve um and secondly how much time and effort are you willing are you uh, are you basically willing to suck huge like it's going to look terrible for a long time until you actually get to the point where you understand how to use a glycam or stabilizer or steady cam or something closer to a steady cam before you actually get to closer uh, footage in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've found particularly that being a Steadicam operator first has helped me massively in terms of using a gimbal. So once you understand the movement that a Steadicam can give you, and you're trying to replicate that to a certain extent with a gimbal, you know how to you know try and get the best out of the gimbal by you know just having a a much more inherent understanding of of camera movement in the first place how it feels to the audience you know it's it's all about the storytelling aspect and you know you're not just trying to stabilize the footage you're trying to tell to tell the story right so um and steadicam is very much more suited to that i think because it has that more human feel to it that more natural look to it yeah absolutely and i think that I think that some people kind of in some ways go out of their way to, I guess, in some ways, like take the easy road, right? Like, oh, I'm going to buy a gimbal because it's easy, right? Yeah. I'm going to buy a gimbal because it's 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 easy to get stable footage, which I can understand, but it will, I think in some ways it will eventually limit you to the level of the look and the things that you're able to be able to produce. Yeah, very in, much. In the respect to high yeah, end, absolutely. Well. And if you're if you're only ever using a gimbal, then you're you're limiting yourself to that thought process as well. You're not because you don't have the finite fingertip control of a Steadicam. You don't realise that that's possible. So you're always you're always compensating for what the the gimbal can give you, rather than uh, having a complete free reign really of the movement with the with the, the Steadicam. Um, 
So yeah, I'd advise anybody who's who even wants to use gimbals better to do at least the sort of bronze low level Steadicam course because it will give you a much bigger understanding of the movement that is most pleasing. Uh, almost whatever your whatever your um, your job is or what you want to do with it. Um, I, I must say, I, I should just uh, say at this point, I you know I have worked for for, for Tiff and who make the big steady cams, um, but that's because I you know fell in love with their products and I, as far as I'm concerned, they're the, the originals and best. Um, uh, I have used glide cams. Uh, the reason I don't is because none of the ones I've used work as well as the proper steady cams. Um, being brutally honest, they just don't have all the all the trim controls necessary to actually make them work as they should do. Um, so if you can find yourself an old Merlin or something, or a Merlin 2, slightly better, um, I think you'll find it's probably a night and day difference, even with your camera setup, than, um, than, than the glide camera you're using at the moment. Because, uh, yeah, just, just the control of it is that much better. In fact, these days, uh, you know, secondhand older full rigs um, go for very little money because people don't really understand what they do. So uh, things like uh, Steadicam flyers and scouts and things like that go for, for relatively very tiny amounts of money and it will completely change the way you, you work uh, compared to the glide cam, I think. Mm. No, I'll definitely, I'll definitely look into that. And, and, or just and borrow mine. It, I think... Yeah, I mean that was, um, you know, as well. I think, but I think that no, I mean, I think it's, I think it's interesting because a lot of people, um, in some ways, get very hepped up on gear. Oh yeah. And I think that it's a kind of shooting yourself in the foot just for the sake of it situation in some ways, um, because you know I could sit here and say, oh, I want X camera, I want Y lens, I want this, 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 right? But. If I don't actually know how to tell a story with it, there's no point in me having it. No, and the and the, the 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 truest example of that is to look at, you know, big professional productions. Yeah, you think Marvel own any cameras? Well, they probably do now. But uh, when it comes to big feature films and even episodic drama, the, the production companies don't own any of the equipment. They they hire it all in because you know each each production each day might require different equipment so they only hire the lenses they need for that day they'll only hire that camera because it gives that look for that job um so yeah owning owning equipment is not a barrier in any way because you can always hire it for you know there's so many places you can hire equipment very very cheaply compared to compared to what they cost you know you can get a whole alexa kit for 200 quid for the day or something and you know you're not going to go out and spend 30,000 quid buy in it but you could have that level of gear for a couple of hundred quid for the day you know it's, it's it's there is a point there is obviously a balance point where being able to shoot stuff for nothing essentially other than your own investment uh is beneficial uh but with the quality of phones particularly these days you know you've got a brilliant video camera in your pocket you know you very rarely actually need something else for um you know for for a huge amount of situations dslrs are good as well of course um but yeah if you're if you're looking if you're if people get too het up on gear hire something decent and you'll realize that you know the level of that stuff is so way beyond what most people as individuals or even as even as small companies can afford to buy why bother don't don't worry about it save your money and hire what you need when you get the job string that's that's a um, a big bit of advice which which always which would never used to be the case it used to be you needed the gear to get the jobs and that's that simply isn't the case anymore no i mean i think that's only a benefit though because i think then you know people are more likely to hire people for the person yeah. right like their skill their 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 the way of telling stories that way of editing you know however however whatever you know of course it's a bonus if you have your own equipment especially when you're working with lower budgets um you know because it, it means you don't have to basically lose personal personally you don't have to lose money because you can use your own equipment that in theory doesn't cost you anything yeah but of, co but of course it does but you know what i mean it doesn't yeah. yeah so you have to so when i when i first my, bought my first big video camera i literally had a spreadsheet and i knew how much it would cost to hire that same camera outfit for the day and and, and I went through every job that was paying me and the gear, I would knock off a certain mm -hmm. amount to essentially 
compensate for the, the, the initial expense of that gear. And you'll think, actually, crikey, it, it actually takes quite a long time with the, you know, what, uh, you know, what equipment costs to hire versus what it is to buy. Um, mm. The difference is if you can make money out of that equipment separately. So my FS700, for example, is the best example of this. I've still got it. It owes me nothing. It's paid for itself 20 times over because I would hire it out separately to me. Um, I, I, I was one of the first people in the country to buy one. Um, before it had even arrived, I'd made a website, fs700hire.com or something, and I was getting hires mm. for it as soon as it arrived. So it paid for itself in six months from external hires without me needing to do a single job for it with it, um, although I did. Mm. The funny thing was I had a, I had a year's interest-free credit on it as well. So I was st- I, it had paid itself off before I'd paid for it. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, which was a nice position yeah, to be. Exactly. Um, so that's that's the that's the, end, the you know the anti argument for owning your own gear as well as if you can make money out of it separately. But otherwise, turning up with it is is you know can end up. I know some people who have bought a- acres of equipment and are constantly investing in things, and they're kind of just go around a circle of debt. And, you know, they barely pay off one thing before it's obsolete and they've got to buy the next one and they don't have the money for it. So they get back into debt again. Um, mm. And that's not, of a, you know, so they sort of almost never end up in profit because every job they're mm. taking is to pay off the equipment. Um, and you don't really want to be in that in that thing. I mean, I, I, I've been lucky and I've, I've sort of had good advice and made sensible decisions with equipment. But um it is very easy to get sucked down that rabbit hole of oh must have that lens or must have that microphone oh must have this must have that i've bought you know i've bought Mm. stuff because other cameramen have them and never use them Mm -hmm. uh Mm. and that's that's also very easy to do no absolutely um so so just to give some context for those who who don't know because there's probably going to be quite a lag from this podcast coming out and the time of filming um excuse me the you know around this time at the moment we're we're lockdown is i'm want to say like basically eased it is basically we're like back to this new normal this weird middle ground normal place um you know from from, from what i've seen yeah anyway yeah where it's it, it's still out there but people are that yeah it's worried. just it's just uh anyway um so how was uh you know winding the clock back a couple of months how was sort of uh lockdown with respect to like did you see a work dip? Did you did? Uh, and then if you did, how did you spend your time? Um, you know, what advice would you give to people who, um, you know, would find? So for example, could I imagine there'll be times where people will have, oh, I want to do this thing, but works slow, or you know, I've got all this extra time and I don't know how to use it effectively to um, long term benefit me. If that makes sense. What what kind of advice would you give um, to them? Firstly and secondly. How was your lockdown experience? I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, well, yeah, lockdown happened and all work cancelled immediately. Uh, I was left with a, the, the future stretching out ahead of me. Um, so the first thing I did was try was set up the old computers there and started capturing my old tapes. So I've got hundreds of old tapes from, from growing up and things like that. And I thought I really should save them, put them on the computer. There's my wife, actually, that said, well, you've got all these cameras and BTRs, uh, videotape machines um and things that well, i'm sure there's other people in the village who've got old cameras and tapes that they want capturing or put on dvd or whatever why don't you offer it and i did and i've done 150 200 tapes in lockdown now which adds 15 20 quid each for you know copying and dvd ising uh it's, it's been a, a, a an unexpectedly significant income um i've also done uh, a lot of editing so I've been putting together you know show reels and little edits of old stuff that I'd never seen the light of day before but I know a lot of people would be interested to see um, I haven't done as much stuff on the on to my website or uh, so that that would probably be my advice is not <laughs> is, is is concentrate on your online profile because that's what is going to end up getting you work we have been having the networking events which is where I think you, you're probably better off looking for work is face-to-face stuff. You send emails to people, they go straight in the spam or, or even if they get seen straight in the bin. Um, and, and quite often the same with phone calls. So if somebody meets you at an event, um, that you're much more likely to, to get them as a contact and potentially get work out of them that way. Um, 
but that hasn't been happening. So uh, at this point, I think it's probably a good idea to really concentrate on your online profile, make sure you turn up in searches, make sure you've got lots of media, current media online that people can, can search and then find you through that on all the channels you can. Uh, my wife is a digital marketer, so she, she's, you know, pushing me to do things like that all the time. And I, I you know, because she's telling me to, I, I, I push back and don't do it. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I think generally that's a good idea, you know. And also uh, something that, that, that I find when I'm doing talks and things for students, um, background knowledge seems relatively poor, even if they've done, uh, you know, a degree in some cases. How film and television came about, not just film film, but television particularly, because, of course, we are all using video cameras now. There's very few people actually shooting shooting film. I'm just I'm just going to get a roll of film just to uh, show that some some people still have it. So uh, those of you uh, who have the miracle of sight on the podcast, this is actually a, a proper reel of 16 mil film. Um, but of course, very few people actually have the chance to use this now. So everything we use are are essentially video cameras and understanding how a video picture is made, um, where it all came from. This country, you know, the UK has a lot to be proud of in terms of coming up with, with the way that broadcasting works in the whole world. And that comes down to every DSLR and phone camera you're using now and having some, a real understanding of how a video picture is put together, how it evolved, um, makes, can make a big difference to A, how you shoot, what you're shooting in the first place, uh, you know, just understanding of color, all that sort of thing, the different color spaces, um, and yeah, just ge general education in 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 what makes a good video picture. Because you can be as creative as you like, but if it's badly underexposed or the colors all off or something like that, the greatest grader or editor in the world will will not be able to save it. So. You know, having a good, using this time to get a really good understanding, a really good technical, um, yeah, understanding of, of video, video pictures, what makes good sounds, you know, and, and I have to say, watching proper, decent productions is, is the best way to learn how, how the professionals do it and how, what you should be looking to emulate, because only once you only once you can do it as well do you really have the the knowledge to push that envelope further you know the greatest artists take the best that already exists and then expand upon it put their own take on it if you don't really understand how the best now exists and how that is made what you're doing is kind of guesswork so however innovative or imaginative you might be from that point on without the the base level understanding of a load of stuff then you know it's it's a shot in the dark rather than and no one's going to pay you for a shot in the dark you're only ever going to get paid for consistency and uh, you know <laughs> doing it properly you know guesswork doesn't doesn't will we'll never pay the bills you've got to know what you're doing and i think that's probably the best advice i could give to people in this time when we have time uh, is to yeah really bone up on your on your theory of, of video pictures, professional sound gathering, um, uh, so that you can so that you've got the basics spot on, so that you have confidence then to expand on them and bend them to your own will for your clients or your own productions. Doesn't have to be for paid work, but you know, the better technically you are, even for little 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 personal projects, uh, the better it will look and the, the, you know, the more exposure you'll get from it. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. I think that because a lot of people talk to me about it in some ways, you know, I spend a lot of my time creating for me, um, partly because I enjoy it, but also because, you know, I'm always trying to fine tune, uh, you know, as you, as you talked about, you know, 
why am I framing it like this? Why am I doing this? Have I thought about doing this kind of motion? Have I thought about doing this? And just experimenting and seeing what works, seeing what I like, seeing what I enjoy, seeing what color grades I like, seeing what color grades I don't like. Um, you know, what were, you know, why should I shoot this project in 10 bit? Why should I shoot this project in 8 bit? What are the benefits of shooting it in 4K versus 1080p, etc.? Um, you know, for where it's going and, and what the client is and, and, and how the client is and, and and also working for me anyway from a lot of what I spent the kind of slower times doing was really fine tuning my kind of okay well how does someone find me firstly so what content do I have coming out that that is you know findable searchable relatable um, but then also how do I take a initial oh I would love to do a video with you how much is your costing how much is this how much is that how much how does that process work how do i take it from a initial message into then actually being a long-term client you know and how do and, and and what is that process look like how does that process look like and how do also other people um do that and that's partly where like this podcast came from originally um was kind of you know my passion for teaching um but also my passion for learning in, 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 in the same respect because I see them as kind of two in the same um, in that respect as well because I think that by me in some ways giving uh, people who sometimes wouldn't necessarily get a platform whatever that you know whatever that means whoever um, but also people who enjoy teaching I think is um, something which can be very 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 beneficial for a lot of people have you found that you've kind of become more of a teacher or a mentor or you know however you want to call it um as you've gone further in your career um yeah not deliberately um the 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 more stuff you do the more you learn the more the bigger productions you work on uh yeah the more you do get asked to come along and do chats and stuff and and working with the national film tv school for so long that that was that was always one of the bits i enjoyed the most actually especially especially teaching the the study cam course because that was my biggest passion and you're talking to a room full of people who are who are who are already passionate and interested about your favorite subject so that was easy um and um yeah so yeah no i think that's yes i think it does happen kind of naturally some you know cameramen sometimes get a, a bad or camera operators i should say but i i would i am being specific with cameramen in this instance that cameramen sometimes get a a bad rep because um quite a lot of the uh more traditional older bbc cameramen um were, were a bit grumpy there's, there's no two ways about it um whereas uh, t- i think in order to succeed these days you you can't you you know they had the luxury of a full-time job forever and none of us really have that anymore. So um, you can't really get away with being a grumpy bugger much um, with that sort of <laughs> in today's world. Um, and consequently, that leads you to leads you to have fascinating chats with people. And if that's if that makes you makes you useful educationally, then then great. You know, I, I just see it as um, I'm just flattered to be asked always when when people want to want to talk to me about things, and I I just always hope I have something something useful uh, to give that they can they can act upon and make a really positive change or or make better films. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I think it's like for me anyway. Something that I've really enjoyed doing and really enjoy doing anyway now is is you know g- talking to people who do do a very similar thing to me. Um, and to sort of seeing how they sort of operate, how they go about doing things, what their productions look like, um, you know, and just to see, not necessarily that like I want to quote unquote steal how you do things or how another person would do well, things. We all learn but, from each other. That's, that's yeah, the world. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, okay, I, I didn't notice that shortcut or they've they've like optimized this this bit that I've been struggling with optimizing uh, and etc. So you take that bit and then and then I think I think you talked about this earlier as well, you know, um, and something I wanted to briefly uh, mention on because you were like, I'll oh, consume old film and, and, and old television. Um, it's definitely something I think everyone should do, but I think you need to consume it in the correct way. In the respect to, if you're going to sit and say, I'm going to watch this film and I'm going to like try and do it to learn, then to make notes on it, you know, oh, yeah. make notes on why is the, don't just sit there and watch it, right? Because if you just sit there and watch it, you'll be kind of hooked into the story. Hopefully if it's good enough, you'll be hooked into the story, but it's, it's actually quite difficult to do, sit there and actually take 
critical notes and look at the technical because the if it's done well enough the whole point of a film is you're not meant to see any of that right oh yeah like absolutely. you're you're you you're literally just meant to you know be able to engage with the characters and been able to engage with the story so i think from a film perspective you have to go into it with two minds either it's i'm going to watch this as a piece of entertainment or i'm going to watch this as a i'm going to try and dissect Analyze. why did they do xyz yeah no right? absolutely i mean if there's any films i'm going to look into like that hitchcock is the master still um kubrick things like that you know go, going back to the people who really knew what they were doing you, you watch it once and try and remember how each scene made you feel so get that as an audience member because that is vital to informing how you then break it down so then you watch it again and maybe take a few more notes and then watch it again uh you know so you're bored of watching it for the story and you're you're you get more and more interested in watching it for the filmmaking and you you start to notice all these wonderful subtle things that the filmmaker does that helps you feel that way that gives the the uh, emotion to that particular character at that point or on that line or on that beat and once you start delving into that it can be quite fascinating and i i don't think some people say that can spoil a film for you but i don't think that's true i think if anything it it enhances the film for you if it's a good film that is if you're only if you're watching a bad film all you see are the mistakes and then the more you you look into it the more mistakes you see but going to uh, you know acknowledged brilliant films the more you watch them the more interesting they get and i think you can everybody can get a lot out of even even if it's just a you know take a take any scene from almost any hitchcock film and literally try and recreate it shot for shot and you'll suddenly get a huge amount more understanding and appreciation of how that's all been set up. Storyboard, choreograph. Spielberg is another one. Uh, you know, he used to storyboard all all his films, uh, action particularly, um, so that he knew exactly what he was after months before they were anywhere near hiring the camera to do it. Um, and that's the skill of a great director and, and breaking down some of his scenes it's just a masterclass. It's an absolute masterpiece. I watched um, uh, Indiana Jones the other day, the Last Crusade. Um, uh, you know, I, those films are more or less flawless, in my opinion. You, you know, you, you couldn't have, have acted, lit, shot, set up, directed a, almost any of those individual scenes better. Uh, just beautiful pieces of work. Um, and you'll find he uses, for example, one of Spielberg's things in those films is, is quite a lot of long takes, you don't, which you don't even realise are long takes, um, where the camera is, is just moving with our characters so effortlessly, not on Steadicam most of the time. This is all track and dolly stuff um, uh, or, or crane stuff, you know, and you suddenly realise, oh, blimey, this, is, this has been the same shot since the, that character entered the scene. And only when it cuts back to the the opposite, his opposite number, is there a camera change. But we've tracked them all the way through this environment so far and not even noticed. And that that is absolute one. It's just beautiful to, to look at. Um, so, yeah, no, film analysis I mean, uh, is important. That, I mean, uh, it, uh, I don't want to go too much into like uh, analysis. Terms, I'd be very curious to hear your opinion if you've seen it of 1917. Um, the the what I can only describe as the humongous one take film, uh, <laughs> that that just seems to be a one take after a one take after a one take after a one take. Uh, do you know it came out when I was really busy and I never saw it at the cinema, uh, and I've been waiting for an excuse to reward myself with it, watching it online, uh, uh, on demand even. Um, and actually, I haven't watched it yet. Well, I feel awful saying that because I know a lot of people who are involved with it. <laughs> um, uh, and it's a it's a go to Steadicam picture now. It's it's gonna. I think it's probably from the way people talk about it. It's it's possibly taking over from The Shining as the Steadicam film. So uh, I, yeah, I am gonna make an effort to watch it soon. <laughs> When I persuade my wife to stay in for an evening, <laughs> um, and it's not so wretched hot. That's a yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is warm. Well, well, enjoy, enjoy it when you get there. But um, it kind of leads on to my next question as well. Well, I should ask be... you what you thought about it, really. Yeah, in terms of camera movements, how did you? How did you react? I mean, from 
for me, I was like, I was trying to see where the cuts were. Um, but that's just from a filmmaking perspective. I'm like, they're going to have a distraction somewhere and they're going to hide a cut here or, or whatever. Oh, but like, uh, you know, or, or et cetera. You know, but for me, um, I was lucky enough to kind of watch it early so I, I could sort of enjoy the behind the scenes as it as it came out um, and watching how they shot it and, and, and et cetera in that respect. But from a storytelling perspective, I think it was very, very, very well done. Um, you know, and and for me, I was more interested to see how they used, um, you know, the the uh, I've forgotten his name, but it's the mimic system. It's like a gimbal and a steady cam. Yeah, that's you right. Because yeah, it has the a, electronal a, end. But Harry it's Trinity, that's cool. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, that's a gim- Yeah, that's so. That's essentially a gimbal head on a normal steady cam. So you get all the fluidity of the movement with yeah. uh, lateral stabilization for your horizon which is always the bit that as a steady cam operator you're you're fighting to control the most um and is yeah. the, the, the the tell of you know, how skillful you are not that anyone mm. ever used no, best take but still <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course not it's always the actor's best take um but 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 no i mean in a in a simple line um it's very very well done um from a from a you know uh, a novice uh glide cam operator or steady camera operator or whatever you want to call it um for me it was it's very nice to see and there's some shots where i'm like how like there's no way there could be someone in this pond right for example um not to ruin the whole film but there is a there is a um what i now know is a crane shot where um it basically just tracks these uh these these two guys going across this a pool or, or something and it's like right on the edge of the pool i'm like how on earth did they do that because it it comes from a shot that must have been on a, st- a dolly or or, a st- or something like that but from from what i saw from the behind the scenes it sort of they found a way to not make you notice the fact that they unhooked it from something and hooked it onto a crane and then it went down and then up with the crane from 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 what i saw but it was it was just it was just well done um you know and i think it's a it's um one of those things that i think will be emulated in the future in very similar ways in the respect to technique wise and um why to do things and how to do things yeah i'm glad um, you mentioned well. the story there though because that still is the most important thing and and as for you know we might appreciate the technical things but the average movie goer doesn't care they are only there to to watch the story and it's that that's why the shining has been the hold up the stand up poster piece for steadicam for all these years because the story is so fascinating as well as being a pioneer of Steadicam movement and uh, storytelling. Um, and so, yes, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's good to hear that, that 1917 fulfills that brief as well, because there have been others, right? There's one which is worth looking up called the Russian Ark. And that's an entire, I think it's hour, hour and a half, full feature film in one Steadicam shot. Uh, and it goes all the way through these palaces and bridges and there's this Russian production. Um, and, and technically it's fascinating, but the story is pretty boring. So it never got, it never got the accolades that it could have done that 1917 is enjoying now or The Shining, um, uh, despite the fact it was kind of the first feature length cinema release film to be shot in one shot on Steadicam, um, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, they had to build special magazines and stuff for it and everything for the, cause it's film film, you know, um, Mm. no it's absolutely, <laughs> even no, that, absolutely. Even I, I was just thinking how could you do how could you even go about doing that unless you want to watch it now because i'm very interested yeah. to see how they did i can't remember i think oh. it was a combination of of very good video assist uh video tap which they used then to, mm-hmm. to ch- when they changed reels or something i can't remember it's 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 an interesting one it's one we talk about on the study cam course um because it's yeah it's quite fascinating it's a big with big reels of film of course this is the this is a good um statistic right so um how much the memory card cost even a really good one 50 quid to buy a reel of 35 mil and this is say 400 foot um this is 16 mil but to buy a film a reel of uh 35 millimeter film will cost about 250 quid that's to buy it to once you've shot it, then you have to process it, and that's another 250 quid. Then you have to telecine it, which is get a digital copy made of it. That's at least another 250 quid, uh, plus all the other bits and pieces are going to you know, you, you're talking around about a thousand pounds 
for a roll of 400 mil, uh, uh, for a 400 foot roll of 35 mil film. Now, how how many minutes of film does that give you? How many minutes of footage? I can't remember what's on my head, but not much. Five minutes, to be honest. Five minutes. No. So, it's not, it's thousand not. pound for five minutes of unedited film. So that's the difference. That's why everything's gone digital. You know, now it's good enough. If you can't, if you, why would you shoot? Why would you shoot film? Um, and that's kind of another another steady cam versus glide cam debate, isn't it? You know, do you want the the digital precision, or do you want something that feels nice and looks looks natural and exciting? Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's always kind of interesting as well. But those that's that was what they were fighting against the early pioneers of Steadicam. They knew they could do these wonderful long takes, um, but the technology uh, of you know actually getting the film to work wasn't it? it didn't work. Wasn't there? Uh, it wasn't yeah, possible because of yeah because of the film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. If there was any uh, production film. Um, you know, episodic drama or, or 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 whatnot that you could work on, that you were given the opportunity to work on, would be your quote unquote dream uh, um, to work not on. One do, you, do you have one? Um, any of those high end stuff that the the, the 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 BBC do, or you know, any of those American dramas thing. I mean, you've got to think that working on Game of Thrones is. Uh, got to be good fun, um, like Bond films and things like that. Those are always the nadir of 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 ambition for everybody because because they've got so big. Um, whereas I think actually, in terms of satisfaction, would be taking the chance on something smaller and watching it get big. I think that that probably would end up being more satisfying if you when you turn up to a set that's absolutely enormous and you've got a million people for every job and it's it's it feels quite impersonal and i've done a few of those and I, there's a reason i don't chase those jobs um and it's because you're one tiny cog in a massive machine and if if it wasn't you there it'd be someone else doing the same job i it's, it's not it's not a time where a, an individual can shine whereas working on smaller productions uh you know, independent films I love particularly because everyone is there because they're passionate about it. Um, everyone appreciates what you're doing that bit more. It's just it's kind of sort of job satisfaction, really. So, although I'd love to say I'd worked on a Bond film, and I've done a few big things. You know, Red Dwarf was probably the biggest I've worked on this year, which to, again, a relatively small production, but you know, it had two cameras rolling all the time. It had a DOP. It had uh you know a dit it had it had acres of people managing the production and uh, wardrobe and costume and sets and uh, the most incredible props and model makers um uh, absolutely wonderful you know so that is it, it's a relatively big production but nothing like a, a bond film or something um so that still had a bit of personal enjoyment for me uh, it's the third series i've done in red dwarf as well so so people do remember you after a bit which is quite nice I and mean, when doug naylor comes up to you on the first day and says oh hi john how are you that that's when i thought this is this is where i need i, I want to be you know <laughs> i found my place here um which is great whereas you know a christopher nolan film or or uh, yeah i say I, I keep coming back to bond films because you know that's been shooting um, that's the biggest thing shooting in the UK over the last few years. Um, uh, you'll turn up on set. You'll you might speak to the ads. You, you might have, this is as a steadicam operator as well, which means you jump a load of the hierarchy. So you might talk to an ad. You might get a chance to speak to the actors when you're actually next to them in the room. Um, but otherwise, then you you back out out the way, sat in the corner with your steadicam everyone you know nobody's interested in you once you've done your shot um and it, it yeah it's it, it becomes quite an impersonal thing and that's not why most of us get into film and television we you get we get into film and tv because we want to we want to make beautiful pictures but we also want to be part of that community and uh that collaboration and and make something that people really care about when they watch it and i find that the bigger the production, the less you come away at the end of the day feeling like that. Um, you feel like a small cog in a big machine, and and that's 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 why I'd rather do ten very low paying independent movies than than one enormous big budget Hollywood one. 
I know that's not a very career focused or um, ambitious um, uh, point of view, but that's just how I feel about it. Having done, having dipped my toes into almost all areas of, of film and TV, that's, that's how I end up feeling. And, you know, when I'm driving home, that's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's, I mean, that's definitely interesting because a lot of people that I've spoken to are like, I want to go to Hollywood. I want to do, I want to work on, you know, the Bonds, the Marvels, the, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, in, in, in that respect. And, and, and for me, as you were sort of explaining that, it, it makes me think a lot about, you know, why people or, or, or people who want to make their own production company over, I want to get hired by John, for example. Or I want to get hired by whatever production, you know, whatever production house it is, or production company, or whatever, you know. And and it's one of those things where I think it's it's for you if your if 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 your fulfillment comes from I built this from nothing, right? I built this from absolutely nothing, didn't exist, and I'm only because of where I am now because of my hard work, right? And I'm now able to employ X amount of people, whatever that may be, right? Um, to you I think that's very important I think that's going to be something which not everyone necessarily um, agrees with or not as not everyone has the same kind of drive well I wouldn't have I wouldn't have when I when I started out all why I wanted to all my whole ambition from the age of about seven or eight years old was to be a BBC Studios cameraman to be working on those shows like um, Live and Kicking and uh, Going Live and stuff like that because they always seemed just to have a wonderful time. Every Saturday morning, all the camera crew were in there. They had a great time. They had a, a format that was worked out that was, you know, brought joy across the land in the days of four channels. And that's all I wanted to do was be a BBC employee and I would have stuck there forever. But by the time I got to be employable, that, that that literally didn't exist, no. And I, I've fallen into what I've, I'm doing now, as, as I think most people do, who who are I hate the word, but creatives, creative people. You want to you want to do something. You want to make something that that you're proud of. You're you're not just chasing a career for that goal or that amount of money. You you want to do something that you're you're pleased with and you want to be proud of at the end of the day to show other people. Um, and uh, consequently, we, you know, although we earn good money for what we do, um, it's not like, like you said, like Disney or Marvel money. Um, but, you know, I think overall we'd be happier human beings the, because we are at least having a chance to fulfill our creative potential mm -hmm. rather than just our, our, our bank. Yeah, absolutely. Accounts. And I think that it's also you take away, I don't know whether you're the same, but when I'm, especially when I'm doing a project and it's just me shooting it, editing it, I have a lot of personal connection to every video because of the amount of hours that go into it, you know, you know, and, and, and I, I think that if you haven't been there for people who like are listening, who, who aren't there yet or, or haven't been there or only work with like one or two other people or whatever, I think you should try at least to do at least one project just on your own just so you can feel and go through the processes of what it's actually like taking a project from an idea in your head to you know that that video whatever that video or that or that commercial or what you know whatever it is um in that respect i think that's i think that's a very important thing to do but also i think it's um you can learn a lot about yourself in doing that as well i think for, for, for from what i found at least i don't know whether you found the same but um you know Oh yeah, completely. I mean, even if it's only learning that I'm no good at sound or I hate editing or stuff like that, all of that is useful going forward because then you know not to try and keep pursuing that, you know, and if you don't get exposure to, to all the different jobs, how do you really identify what you really are good at or want to do forever? You know, a lot of people are, are, um, you know, mm. enjoy photography but could they do it all day, every day, or would they end up hating themselves and getting bored over the, after the first month? You know, it's the difference between, between passion and, uh, you know, just something to fill the time with. And th that, that, that makes a big difference in, in when you're trying to make a film on your own, because you're, you're trying to do everything. You're trying to get everything right. And then you, you realize there's so many whole, I mean, it, it, this happens to me now, Still, uh, you realise there's always holes in your knowledge because on every shoot, 
bar none, a situation will come up with that you hadn't mm. anticipated or didn't have exactly the right amount of gear for or don't quite know how to solve. Um, and, 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 and that's the most useful learning thing. That's why this continues to be the most fascinating profession for me, because you are constantly exposed to new places, new situations, new people, new equipment, new ways of working. And it just keeps everything all more interesting and, and you're learning all the time. No, absolutely. And I think it goes back to also, you know, I was working on a project this morning and I'm like, half the footage doesn't want to import, right? Okay. Why? <laughs> what, what, what? Why? Okay. Um, let's let's solve this problem. Um, you know, in that respect, I think, it's, I think it's one of those things where it's just, you sort of, I don't know whether you found it, but the more you do it, the more you kind of, in some ways get excited for the problem because you're like oh it's this opportunity i can work out a way to solve it um or i'm going to take a skill yeah. away from this or oh, that, yeah, that kind of thing all the time yeah I, I literally literally every job uh is is like that for me because because every job's different uh even if it's just a lot of what i do is is nicely lit good sound interviews for a multitude of different purposes, you know, big, big uh, corporate clients or, or little TV shows or something like that. But that's my stock in trade is, is, is really nice, beautifully composed, properly exposed, good sound, good lighting interviews. But of course, every interview is shot in a different place with a different person who requires a little bit of tweaking to the lighting to be the most flattering. Um, the environment needs to be taken into account with that as well. So is there natural light you can use? Is the natural light going to cock up your shot? Um, you know, is there sound issues? You need to, you know, baffle over their heads because it's uh, too echoey. Um, you know, does the tie mic make them sound too... Uh, basey are you going to need to rig up the 416 instead uh you know that you're problem solving from the moment you get on to any new location and um yeah that's that that is that is the biggest joy for me once you've got it up once, once you've once you've got it up sorry once you've got the camera up once you've got the picture up once you're um uh once you've got everything set yeah, boring. You can go and have a cup of tea then, apart from monitoring the sounds, because the hard work's done. The, the challenge is over in a, in a, in many ways. You've you've done the job. The job happened. The job is done before you hit record, in my opinion. Um, but because by the time you get to that place, you know when you hit record, everything is going to be fine. Uh, you know your your pictures are being backed up. Your sound is is uh, is really good. The 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 dog next door has been taken away and shot, so that it won't bark and interrupt your soundtrack. Uh, you know you've taken care of everything, so that when you hit record, you can walk away and you know it's going to be fine. And that that's that's how I kind of judge whether I've done my job properly. But also, you know that's that's the joy of it is solving all those little challenges and using your knowledge and experience and equipment to overcome and make the best of every situation you can you, you're in um and so many people lack one element of that so uh don't quite get as good pictures or you know sometimes it's 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 not as simple as that sometimes you know you're 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 pressed so much for time or budget that you you can't get all those elements perfect because you just haven't got the time to do it you've got to get in there get out onto the next job um and that's what that's the that's uh, conversely that's uh, you know getting it all right and perfect is the biggest joy not having the time or budget to do that is the biggest sadness for me as well um and and almost always that's not in your control um so you no know. oh yeah get there at 11 we'll all be set up by 11:30 no could i have an hour set up, please. Makes no difference to the client or the, the the talent or anything like that. Just just so I I get I I routinely get to interviews early now, if only just to look at the room and find out where the PowerPoint is. Yeah, absolutely. Are. That's what I was gonna <laughs> say. I mean, it's like okay, uh, that amount of time you think is gonna take to set up, double it, and then you might be on time. Um, because in reality, yeah. that that first idea you had to how it's gonna be, lit, how it's gonna work, where they're gonna sit, how it's gonna be f f sound, everything. It won't. It either will be have to be so much tweaking. It will take you an extra half an hour, or you'll have to completely do it all over again because of six different reasons that you'll only find out after you've set everything up. 
um you know I, I, yeah yeah always always have at least two setups in mind when you're when you're doing any interview i think because inevitably something will go wrong at the last minute the sun will come out which will bathe the whole room in a totally different light or the washing machine which has been put on and now can't be switched off for an hour will come on so they've forgotten about it you know and you've got to move to a different room so always have always have a backup plan i think it's it's also another good yeah, bit of advice I think that it's also about i don't know whether you find this as well but also making kind of explain to the client the the realities in the respect to right this is actually going to take x right amount of time this is why because I have to go through, not necessarily in grave detail, unless they want grave detail, but like, you know, I have to go through this process, this process, this process, this process, right? Yeah, and they don't care either. They don't They don't care about knowing what the details are. They only want to know definites. Can you be ready in half an hour? No. Why not? And then you have to explain it. But uh, yeah, and, th and that comes down to experience of the directors as well. I, I've worked with some very good and some very bad directors. And, and uh, those good ones appreciate hopefully that you know what you're doing and if you need to, an extra 10 minutes it's worth it uh and the bad ones just want to get it on get it in the bag get out of there get their check uh so yes you have to there's always an element of client management with uh, with all of these things um but that can also come from from the person who's supposed to be managing you and and managing their expectations yes we can do it quickly but it'll be crap or you could we could just turn up half an hour early and and it will look, look a lot better oh okay that's reasonable but not everyone is reasonable of course so we all have to uh, you know yeah. choose the battles. yeah absolutely <laughs> is there do you find cuz for me i'm finding especially when budget is a push i mean ideal situation okay i run camera and then we have an interviewer and an interviewee Right. Do you find sometimes when that you as a camera up, you, you may not um, have this, but I find I'm also sometimes the interviewer as well. Yes, very often. Uh, well, not directly. I would I will. Uh, these days I'm 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 there with the interviewer. Uh, I'm almost never have to be the interviewer, but quite often it's somebody from the company or not a very experienced director or PA or something, production assistant, um, who are asking the questions. So because I have an understanding of editing through doing my own stuff, um, I, you know, well, and lots of client stuff over the years, um, and having and working with good directors, I know what questions are going to be useful for the edit, how to rephrase edit uh, questions so that they will get better answers. Um, so that yes i suppose the answer to your question is yes i find that i am even with guys who have done it for 50 years uh there's one guy i work with um a wonderful guy um worked with him quite regularly he used to you know run a newsroom at itv uh and he's done bbc and stuff like that as a journalist he still asks closed questions all the time um and he does it to get uh, you know, to show the, the information, show the, the interviewee the information he wants in the answer. But because he asks in a closed way, they, uh, some people just get cussed and say, yes. You know, I'll say, oh, is it important to you that uh, the, uh, you know, the setup for this has gone on for months and that the, the client has taken care of all this and that and, and all these specific that I want to you include in the question. Is that important to you? Yes, it is. You know, it gives them nowhere to go. Um, so every now and again, uh, fairly regularly, in fact, I'll just, at the end, I'll just say, what do you think about it? Oh, I loved it. I loved the way they did this. I loved the way they did that. This is da da da. All the specifics in an answer with a bit of passion. Uh, you know, it, it's a much more open question. So, yeah, I find that I am, I, uh, you know, the director or producer or PA or whoever's there, or sort of person, you know, the client, representative whoever's there at the time often isn't thinking of the edit they're thinking of the question um and potentially the, the answer they want to the question rather than what answer will be most useful for the edit uh so yeah I've, i i i actually have to do that quite a lot actually you now you've said that I, I can't think of a i can't think of an interview i've done this year that i haven't had to jump in on and just mind if mm -hmm. i ask something mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> at the end. Uh, no, that, I mean that's great to hear. I mean for me, because um, you know, for for multiple reasons. I mean, I I deal with um, or de- deal with is the wrong word, but like I I do interviews with people who are very um, I use the term uncomfortable with being on camera. Um, they don't they don't they they, they don't like the oh, idea. Yeah, they find it very intimidating. Yeah. They're like, how do I come across? They're very, they're very um, self conscious. Well, you you should try not to do them nude, Carlton. I'm I'm sure that puts people off. <laughs> Put your clothes on, man, again. Oh, dear. Um, I don't even know where to go with that. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming on. But yeah, making people comfortable is a big part of that as well, isn't it? And and, and again, that, counts down, that comes down to having adequate time beforehand. You know, if you think it's going to take you an hour to set up cameras, lights, everything like that, get there an hour and a half early. So you've got time once you've set everything up to have a cup of tea and a biscuit with the person you're going to interview so that they feel comfortable with you so that when you sit down in front of the camera, it's more like talking to somebody they already know, they're already friendly with. And that, that, that takes a huge amount of stress out of their, out of them and their answers then. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a massive thing. I, I, very few people I interview, I, even the celeb, I, Red Dwarf, for example, I was the behind the scenes cameraman, which is the most fun job because I, I answer to nobody. I turn up when I when I need to, when there's something interesting going on. I get to talk to everybody in every department. I'm not subject to the hierarchy of the production. Um, and, uh, you know, but that means that I actually have to get useful stuff from people. So having a chat to the DOP while he's in the middle of lighting a scene, you know, I just wander up with the Steadicam and say, oh, hey, Ian, uh, so what are you lighting here then? Oh, John, this is amazing. We're going to do this and this and this and this. Um, and you know, I had a, I was able to do that because I'd gone, I'd made a point of going and having a cup of tea, noticing when he went to have a cup of tea at the crew van, uh, a catering van earlier in the day, and had a had a chat with him for ten minutes over a cup of tea. Um, and it's exactly the same when you're doing a setup interview with people. You know, having giving enough time to talk to them, make them comfortable with you, understand that what you're doing is not intended to catch them out or make them look stupid or whatever uh makes you know makes a massive massive difference to people you're no, i think there's a lot of you know I think that's very very valuable especially people who are looking to do more interviews and you know personally i'm looking to do more interviews because personally i just enjoy interviewing people um as well but also something which i think that there's quite a lot of especially in the business world is definitely something which i think you can get a lot from in the respect of one interview you can basically then use as a base layer for you know a good amount of content for that business you know personally i found well that, that this is this is the way that all television news works there's a key interview and they cut that down to what the bare bones of the story is or the angle they want to tell on the story and then illustrate it with cutaways. So, you know, 90% of it, the, the person's not even on screen, but their words are, um, are heard. And uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly how, how most people run <laughs> um, for almost every interview situation. Um, it's, it's a bed of words. And so however good your beautiful pictures are which is always always the hardest thing for me to watch you know i've spent so long getting this picture absolutely perfect and for 90 percent of the program uh, cutaways cover it uh, <laughs> but yeah that's that's standard building blocks of, of video production no definitely but i think it's also you know for me i've been sort of in some ways trying to take it into um areas or you know uh, sectors that it, that's very new to um you know in that respect so i think that for me anyway that's been very interesting to hear how it's kind of from a more tv um angle um and sort of how your process is to really relax that um interview i guess would be the best a best way to describe it um in that respect as well so so yeah is there anything that you wanted to cover wanted to mention wanted to bring up oh uh not really not without without knowing your your usual um uh, your usual uh, way you do these things um well i i mean the the podcast i mean it has a very, a very brief structure at the start and then it sort of just goes t- however the conversation has gone and then i sort of uh, you know depending on the um guest or depending on the person i'm interviewing will then de- will then depend on where the podcast actually goes 
um, in that respect, you know, I've gone many different directions depending on the um, interviewee in, in, in that respect. Yeah, I mean, we we could just end with uh, with some some words just to say people are, uh, you know, keep filming, keep keep making films is always my biggest bit of advice to anybody who who wants to get into film and television or, or already is in keep making your own films because that's the a it's the biggest learning opportunity it's the biggest chance to these days to to get your stuff seen um to expand your knowledge and experience and just to have fun doing you know doing what it is you want to do and indeed find out if which bit of it you do want to do uh because that is a big thing you know not everybody wants to do every job and not everybody is good at doing every job so um you know yeah keep keep making your own films is my biggest biggest bit of advice and i hope everybody out there uh listening um has found something useful from from what i've said um uh, and if not, I, 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 it's been at least worthwhile listening to. So, <laughs> thank you very much for for having me on. It's been fascinating to talk to you. No, yeah, it's all right. It's um, no, I think there's a lot of value there, and I think it gives a very good insight from you know a lot of the people who listen to the podcast at the moment. Anyway, at the time of filming, are very uh, new. Um, they're either not video production people or they are, but they're very, very, very early. Um, and, and, you know, just building off what you, you said about Korean films, I also think it gives you a great opportunity to experiment stuff where it doesn't matter whether it goes wrong. You know, I'm just going to mess yeah, around yeah, and do this shot and I have no idea if it's yeah, going to work, but... <laughs> But if it looks amazing and it lasts a minute and goes on Instagram and gets loads of loads of interest, you might get a job. Uh, that's that's the weirdness of the world we live in right now. One of my friends has no digital profile at all, no CV online, no nothing. He just puts beautiful pictures on Instagram, uh, particularly uh, hyperlapses are his thing. And he has flown all over the world to do hyperlapses now. For, for other people he doesn't need to be good at any other aspect of film and tv at all um uh which is good because some of his 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 skills are um you know a bit bare in other places uh he's got he loves doing hyperlapses he's got the best in the he's got the best he could possibly be at them and he gets paid handsomely to go all over the place to do that so finding your niche is uh is another another useful thing to look at these days um but yeah keep watching keep watching films keep looking at films keep trying to emulate things you like and keep 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 shooting that's uh that's probably the the biggest advice is no advice yeah, I keep learning give. i think is the main thing there for keep learning absolutely for those who uh don't know of you and would would like to see some of your work or would like to see some of your socials where where can uh, people find you uh, well, I'm on the social medias. Uh, I'm on the Instagram and Twitter. I'm at the Steadicam Man, um, and my business is at Fry Film. Uh, I've also got pages on the on the Facebook and things. Steadicam operator John Fry, I think, is my website and the the Facebook page. Um, otherwise, I pop up in various places, uh, books, making of, all that sort of thing, and of course, on the new Red Dwarf: The Promised Land DVD and Blu-ray. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's really great talking to you. And uh, yeah, as I say, I'll, I'll keep you posted um, when this episode ends up going out. But um, but yeah, I, th- I think there'll be um, possibly some other opportunities to collaborate in the f- in the future as well. So um, no, it was great. Well, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just second camera on something, uh, um, you know, either one of us <laughs> for any <laughs> any reason. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a great thing you're doing. It's one of the things that I have always wanted to do. Actually, is uh, is is do a sort of podcasty thing, and it's one of those things. I I got so many things. I want you know I want to do films around Salisbury. You've been doing that, um, and and it's purely because I, I have these great ideas. I get to the stage where I'm, I've planned them and and got storyboards and everything like that, and then real work comes in, and I never get round to it. Um, and even during lockdown, I've had enough work to keep me here all the time that even those fun things that I want to do and would give me exposure and all that sort of stuff, I just haven't got around to doing because I've been pace- chasing the money. Oh, it's, well, it's a shame. It's uh, God, God, I've got to pay the mortgage, you know. It's a shame. 
and uh, and after you've been you know doing editing for someone else for uh, you know hours and hours and hours the last thing you want to do is sit down there for another more hours and hours and hours to editing your own stuff for no money um so i have to say that does kill my enthusiasm for editing particularly which is a uh, shame because i have i've literally dozens of projects shot that uh, i've never got around to editing um because i like the shooting i don't like the editing that's fair enough <laughs> so if you know know anyone who wants to do more editing and hasn't got material I'm, I've, got, I've got lots of jobs for this. i will uh <laughs> i will definitely um keep some people in mind and I'll, I'll i'll see what i can do for you um in in the editing department anyway but uh but yeah as i say thank you so much for coming on and um uh, we'll be in touch very very soon i'm sure so I hope you guys did enjoy that interview and did take some value from it. John is a very, very lovely guy to have a chat with and very, very interesting. And he has a, a valued or a large amount of uh, experience when it comes to steady cam operation, as you would have heard just now in um, the interview with him. So if you did enjoy this episode and would like not to miss next week's episode where I'll be interviewing uh, the guy who actually made my intro. So uh, that's going to be pretty fun. Pretty fun. Pretty awesome. It was a lovely, lovely chat. Um, so that'll be going out next week at 6pm on Monday. So thank you guys so much for coming back and watching once again. And I'll see you very, very soon. And uh, yeah, have a good week. I'll see you on Wednesday for a brand new YouTube video. And uh, enjoy. Uh, what what uh, this week has for you, and I'll see you 